Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to one of our uh, sessions, uh, our webinars, weekly webinars. Um, and I hope all of you got a chance to see our disclaimer and you went through it and uh, you familiarized yourself with it. Before I continue to introduce our honorable speaker today, or our very special speaker this evening, let me start with a few housekeeping rules while we are also waiting for a few more people to start entering the session. Um, as usual, please refrain from using the raised hand bar, but type your comments or your questions in the Q&A tab and avoid the chat bar as well. Your certificates will be loaded onto your profile on the SADA platform. If you do not have a profile, you can create a profile on the SADA platform and your certificate will be loaded there. I know that a lot of you are still waiting for your Congress certificates. We are working on it. Latest next week, Friday, all your certificates will be uploaded on the platform, including the Congress certificates. This event tonight qualifies for one, C one clinical CEU. And just for those who are struggling to join in via uh, the, the Zoom link, please can you just join us on, on, on our YouTube platform? We are streaming live on YouTube. You can be able to receive the same uh, 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 webinar on YouTube. Now, um, just a, a reminder to everyone to complete the evaluation form that will appear at the end of the webinar. Our next uh, webinar will be on the 28th of September as we conclude Oral Health Month, where we will be having another or our last SASPIO event, which will be on the 28th of September. Now, I'd like to introduce our guest today or our speaker today. She's a guest this evening, a colleague of mine, uh, a very, uh, who has become a friend, by the way, a, a friend of mine who in the office. And um, she joined SADA uh, just recently in January after spending 14 years in private practice. So she's got a wealth of knowledge that she can impart on you guys. Um, Dr. Tinesha Pabu is a graduate from the University of Pretoria. And um, I don't want to take up any time. I know that a lot of you are looking forward to this webinar and the information that she's going to give us. So without wasting any time, Dr. Pabu, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Matsing, for that awesome in introduction. Um, I'm gonna share my screen quickly. Okay, are you able to see my screen? All good, Dr. Pabu, all good. Okay. okay, great. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues. So today I'm going to be discussing a topic that comes up really often, almost every day at the SADA head office with many practitioners, assistants and receptionists alike seeking clarity on the correct ICD-10 coding to apply to their medical aid claims. And it is my sincere hope that after watching this evening, you will have achieved a greater understanding of how to apply ICD-10 coding to your claims, which will hopefully then result in far fewer rejections on your claims. Okay, so let us start at the beginning. What is ICD-10? So ICD starts for the International Classification of Diseases, and therefore ICD-10 would be the 10th revision of the International Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. So many of you may be asking, what is the purpose of ICD-10 coding? Is it just here to cause the occasional head scratch for the dentist? The answer is no. ICD-10 coding actually serves a distinct purpose in that it allows for recording, analysis, interpretation, and comparison of data that is related to conditions, diseases, injuries, et cetera. So in short, it is an alphanumeric code explaining why a procedure was done. It is between three and seven characters in length, and currently there are more than 72,000 ICD codes present. So let's look at the ICD-10 background now in South Africa. The codes were issued um, to the Department of Health by the, by the World Health Organization in 1996. 
and they have then been implemented in the medical scheme environment as of July 2005, and they are being enacted by the Council for Medical Schemes via the Medical Schemes Act. Then we have the master industry table, and this is the table where one might, may find all the ICD-10 codes that are currently in use in South Africa. And this is considered the healthcare industry standard um, for ICD-10 coding. The current version of your master industry table is available on um, the National Department of Health website, and it is dated the 16th of March, 2021, and it's being updated every July. So now let's look at how ICD-10 codes are used by medical schemes. The schemes will use the ICD-10 codes to inform them about what conditions, conditions their members are being treated for by healthcare practitioners so that their claims can be settled cor correctly. Oftentimes, dentists become quite irate when their claim, claims are being rejected due to incorrect or incomplete ICD-10 coding. But it is worth remembering that according to Regulation 5F of the Medical Schemes Act, all schemes must and all your claims must contain relative, relevant diagnostic code that relates to the health service. And therefore, schemes are well within their right to reject claims that refer to incorrect or incomplete coding. So it is also worth um, remembering that medical scheme entitlements are actually based on diagnosis and procedures, which determine how much money is made available for each benefit. And so if the patient or the doctor does not divulge such information, the scheme can rightly question what they are paying for, and they may re refuse payment for the services rendered. In 1999, prescribed minimum benefits or PMBs were introduced by the Medical Schemes Act. One must remember that entitlement to these benefits is driven by a diagnosis and they are appropriately identified using ICD-10 codes. Um, also, the Council of Medical Schemes, um, they assist the Department of Health in measuring compliance of the schemes in implementing ICD-10 codes. We've often seen the case where medical schemes suddenly become strict with the ICD-10 coding, and it may seem like it's been happening overnight. But this is usually happens when the scheme has been audited by um, CMS, and they were then instructed as the regulator by the regulator to actually tighten the belt with regard to ICD-10 coding. So besides the ICD-10 codes becoming quite complex and cumbersome, what are their actual benefits? Well, there are a few. Firstly, they allow for data collection globally for comparison and evaluation of the outcome of the population. Secondly, they'll also allow for the improvement in quality healthcare and clinic clinical management by documenting health events for earlier detection and better tracking. And the documenting of COVID-19 cases would actually be a classic example of this point. Then as mentioned previously, it also allows for the accurate reimbursement of accounts by medical schemes and better understanding of the value of new procedures. It also helps schemes um, prevent and detect healthcare fraud and abuse. And it is also used to identify trends as well as the burden of disease. So now let us compare the difference between procedure codes versus diagnostic codes. So your ICD-10 codes, they tell us what the diagnosis of the patient was, and they consist of diseases, conditions, injuries, signs and symptoms, external causes of injuries and conditions, etc. While your procedure codes are the treatment that has been uh, carried out to remedy the situation. And this, like everyone knows, um, consists of your consultations, your examinations, procedures, radiographs, lab codes, etc. Basically, everything that a dentist does in everyday practice. So let's break down the ICD-10 code bit by bit. But if you look at the screen, the anatomy of the ICD-10 code. This is a basic framework of any ICD-10 code. The first character, it's always a letter, and it can be any letter from A to Z except for the letter U. This is then followed by two numbers. So this would be the minimum code, which consists of three characters. 
The second number is then followed by a decimal point. So your, your first three characters will indicate the category of the diagnosis. The next three characters, which is character three through to six, indicates the related etiology. So that is the cause or set of causes, the manner of causation of the disease or the condition, the um, anatomic site, the severity, or any other vital clinical information. Then finally, there's the seventh character, which is known as the extension. And although this code is almost never used in dentistry for the sake of inclusion and completeness, I will just explain that um, it is only used in certain chapters to provide information about the characteristic of the encounter, such as was the encounter, the initial encounter, the subsequent encounter, et cetera. A valid ICD-10 code is an ICD-10 code that is published in the master industry table and it's based on your WHO rules and conventions, whereas a complete ICD-10 code is a code that has been specified to the maximum level of specificity as published in the master industry table based on WHO rules and conventions. So thinking back to the previous slide, let us look at the primary code. So this code would be the first three characters of the ICD-10 code. And this is your minimum basic code that describes the primary diagnosis. First character would be a letter, like we said, any letter from A to Z except for U. It is then followed by two numbers, which could be any numbers from 00 to 99. So the primary code was, must always appear in the primary or the first position on the claim. Example that we all know and use often is K01 here. So the K refers to the body system that the claim relates to, for example, the digestive system. And 01 refers to the type of disorder that is affecting that body system. In this example, it would refer to embedded and impacted teeth. It is important to note that there can only be one primary diagnosis at the end of a healthcare episode. And most of the codes that are dentally significant are um, in chapter K, which is digestive system diseases, but it could really be found anywhere in any chapter, especially for specialist codes. So now we're gonna look at the secondary code. So the secondary code refers to the part of the code that appears after the decimal point preceding the primary code. And this is now used to further describe the condition or the cause of the patient encounter. So from our previous example, K01, we can now add the decimal point and the number one as the secondary code to specify that the patient was diagnosed with impacted teeth. So code would now read K01.1. So now we're going to look at a few examples that um, stem from the diseases of the oral cavity and salivary glands, and these are all three and four character codes. So K00, these relate to disorders of tooth development and tooth eruption. An example of this would be your supernumerary tooth, which is K00.1, that's a four character code. K01 refers to embedded and impacted teeth. K02 would be the set of codes that all um, link to dental caries. K03 would be other diseases of the hard tissue of teeth, such as attrition, um, erosion, abfraction, et cetera. K04 would relate to diseases of the pulp and periapical tissues, such as a periapical abscess. K05 would be gingivitis and periodontal diseases. K06 would relate to other disorders of gingiva and the edentulous alveolar ridge, for example, gingival recession, K06.0. K07, dentofacial anomalies, including malocclusion. Um, these would mostly encompass your orthodontic codes. K08 would be other disorders of teeth and supporting structures. Example, your loss of teeth due to an ex extraction, K08.1. 
K09 would be cysts of the oral region, not elsewhere classified. So for example, an odontogenic cyst. Um, K10 would be other diseases of the jaws, for example, alveolitis, K10.3. K11, um, diseases of salivary glands, for example, sialolithiasis. K12, stomatitis and related lesions, example, aphthous ulcers. K13, other diseases of the lip and oral mucosa, for example, a leukoplakia. And K14 would be diseases of the tongue, for example, geographic tongue, K14.1. So it is important to remember that these are just headings and there are, they are separate subheadings under each heading, which will give you an indication as to um, if, the, if the caries, for example, falls in enamel caries, dental caries, um, etc. So the list is available on the SADA website. You can consult the list for more detail. So other coding chapters besides the chapter K that would be relevant to dentistry would be the chapter Z. And chapter Z represents factors that influence health status and the contact with health services. So in other words, it's the reason that the patient actually arrived to see you and why you had that patient encounter. And the most common one that everybody uses on a daily basis would be your dental examination ICD-10 code, which is Z01.2. The S codes, which uh, come from chapter 19, and these indicate injury, poisoning, and certain other consequences of external causes. For example, a jaw fracture. T codes are also from chapter 19, and they demonstrate the effect of a foreign body entering through an orifice. So this, for example, would be a patient who swallows a burr or swallows an endodontic file. Um, those would all come from the T codes. Then we have the R codes, and the, these indicate symptoms, signs, um, and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings. For example, if a patient presents with paresthesia of the lower lip. Um, it is important also to remember that the R codes also represent those codes that you would use if you were unable to reach um, a diagnosis when the patient presented. So you would use the signs and symptoms code from the R code, chapter 18. And then lastly, the M codes, which is chapter 13, these relate to the musculoskeletal system. So they include TMJ disorders. The most important thing here also is to remember is that the S and T codes must always be followed by supplementary or an external course codes. And these codes begin with a V, a W, X, or Y, but I'll explain that a bit later on. So let's look at the five character codes. These are a little bit more complex than the three and four character codes. The fifth character will give us more information about certain things such as the anatomical site of the diagnosis. If a fracture is an open fracture or a closed fracture, the place or the type of activity that was undertaken when the event occurred and it is also um, important to remember that they, these, the same coding chapters that I mentioned before will apply to five character codes as well. Let us look at some examples of five character codes. So if we look at the M codes, which relate to the musculoskeletal system, the fifth character will indicate the site of involvement. That is which muscle or joint was involved. So if we are trying to code for pain in the TMJ, so we know that the TMJ would relate to the musculoskeletal system, which is the M codes. M25 refers to other joint disorders not elsewhere classified. M25.5 would be pain in a joint. And M25.58 would be pain in a joint and other site, and other site referring to not those sites mentioned in the list under the M codes. And in this case, MJ would refer to the skull. So your final code would be 25.58. So if we look at the S codes, um, in a wound or fracture, the fifth character would indicate whether the fracture is open or closed. So the S codes, they relate to injury, poisoning, and certain other consequences of external causes. So 2.5 is a fracture of tooth code. 
Um, SO2.51 at the end indicates that it is an open fracture versus SO2.50 indicates if it is a closed tooth fracture. If you cannot determine whether it is an open or closed tooth fracture, then you can use the default code, which is SO2.51 or open fracture. And it is worth remembering that all S codes will have five characters. This is except for one code, which is SO3.2, which refers to dislocation of a tooth. So now I'm going to throw a bit of a spanner in the works by explaining the external course codes or supplementary codes. So these codes are only to be used with S and T codes and they are never valid in the primary position. The external course codes allow for the classification of environmental events, circumstances and conditions as the cause of the injury or poisoning, etc. The external course codes must be always used to the maximum level of specificity for the code to be considered complete, and they are applicable in your four and five character codes. The external course codes will always only begin with V, W, X, or Y. V relates to transport accidents. Um, w would relate to falls and exposures to inanimate objects. Y would relate to exposure to other incidents, such as complications of medical and surgical care. And the external course codes will also be found in the master industry table and um, in the WHO ICD-10 volume one in chapter 20 under external causes of morbidity and mortality from code V01 to Y98. So what happens if you are unable to reach a diagnosis? It's happened to all of us at some point in time. The important thing to remember with these patients is that you should not report the code for the condition that you suspect, but rather use the signs and symptoms codes that you see, which are found in chapter 18 or the R codes. So the same rules would apply though. The patient's condition must be coded to the maximum level um, of specificity and the highest degree of certainty. An example of this would be a patient who comes in com complaining of a constant mouth breathing and heavy snoring at night. You are unsure of the diagnosis. You're not sure if this is due to nasal allergies, nasal polyps, a deviated septa septum, etc. You decide then to make a snoring device. Code for this would then lie in the R codes because you are unsure of the diagnosis. So you would use your sign and symptom code. The eventual code would be RO6.5, where RO6 equals um, abnormalities of breathing, and RO6.5 refers to mouth breathing. Let us look at an example of external course codes. So you have a patient who presents at your room. Um, the patient says he was cycling in his residential estate, and he subsequently fell off his bike, um, sustaining a jaw fracture. So with an injury, you know that injury codes are all related in the S codes. Injury, poisoning, and certain other consequences of external causes. And you would look at what, what was the injury? It was a jaw fracture. So SO2 relates to fracture of the skull and facial bones. Um, while the injury relates to the mandible, you then apply SO2.6, which would be a um, fracture of the mandible code. Then you need to code as to whether the fracture was an open fracture or a closed fracture. If you are not sure, you would use your open fracture code, which is a one at the end, so SO2.61. But this is an incomplete code because as I mentioned previously, all S codes and T codes need an external course code. Therefore, you need to look at the sections V, W, X, or Y. V relates to transport accidents. Your patient was cycling, so this would be the most appropriate. V18 would be a pedal cyclist injured in a non-collision transport accident, meaning he didn't bump into anybody else while he was cycling. And then V18.01 would indicate a pedal cyclist injured in a non-collision transport accident, a non-traffic accident, while engaged in a leisure activity for those people who actually consider cycling leisure activity and not exercise. The complete code here would be then the 
for fracture open door fracture code, which is S02.61, followed by a forward slash, and then your external course code, which is V18.01. So the key here is you need to always aim to be as specific as possible. Let us look at a few common examples. These are examples that I'm sure everybody encounters in everyday practice. The first one, a patient consults for a general examination and a scale and polish. So if you would think of your clinical codes, you would obviously apply 8101, your oral exam code, 8109 times two, infection control, your sterilized instruments, your bite wings or intraoral radiographs, um, a scale and polish, fluoride treatment, and then you determine that there's no other treatment that is needed. And therefore you put your 8120, which is your treatment plan completed code. So now if we think about the ICD-10 codes, we know with an oral examination, um, and the most common Z code that we would use would relate to Z01.2. This is clearly stated in the ICD-10 guide. This is a dental examination code. Because your infection control and your um, sterilized instruments and your radiographs all centered around the oral examination, this was the reason you needed um, to build these codes, they would then follow suit. So they would also have the Z01.2 code. Then um, it's another variation with bite wings. You can either put Z01.2, but what is also acceptable is if you use Z01.6, which is a radiological examination, not elsewhere classified. That's also acceptable. For 8159, which is your scale and polish code, you would bill, uh, bill it as K03.6, where K03 relates to other diseases of heart tissue and teeth, and K03.6 in particular would relate to deposits or accretions on teeth. 8162, um, fluoride treatment. So fluoride is a preventative or a prophylactic measure, and this code is then Z29.8, which relates to other specified prophylactic measures. And then yet again, the treatment plan completed would go to Z01.2. A second example. This is a little bit more difficult than the first one. The patient presents with pain in the wisdom tooth area and he complains of being unable to open his mouth. And after consultation and an examination of the plan, you determine that 3.8 and 4.8 are impacted and currently present with pericoronitis. So you mutually agree with the patient to refer the patient to a maxillofacial surgeon, and then you issue him with a prescription in the meantime to relieve the pain and infection. So the clinical codes here would be 8104, which would be your limited oral exam code. Since you didn't do a full oral examination, you just addressed the main complaint of the patient. 8109 times two, again, infection control, um, instrumentation, and then your panoramic radiograph that was taken. So here, it's important to know that you cannot use Z01.2 for the 8104 code. Z01.2 would relate to a full oral exam. You didn't do a full oral exam, you just examined the main complaint, and therefore you would need to you would need to use your A05 code, which relates to gingivitis and periodontal disease. So here, the ICD-10 code for all the codes needs to follow the initial diagnosis, which is Pericoronitis, and therefore that is listed under K05.5 as other periodontal diseases. Again, for 8115, which is your radiograph, you can use Z01.6. With the third example, following a diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis on two six of a patient, an endodontic rotary file unfortunately separates while you are performing root canal treatment. After a discussion with the patient, you mutually agree to refer to a specialist and place a temporary restoration in the interim. So at this appointment, you charge the following codes, 
infection control codes, sterilized instruments, local anesthetic, as well as your root canal preparation. Now, this code is a little bit more complex because you know that your T codes would refer to um, complications of medical and surgical care. In this case, this would be T88.8, .8, and it is not elsewhere classified. And then a Y, you know that an S and a T code would have to be followed by an external course code, as mentioned previously. So the most appropriate code in this instance would be Y61.9. And this refers to a foreign object that is accidentally left in the body during unspecified surgical and medical care. And obviously, the foreign object would be the endodontic file. I pray this never happens to any of you. Our second last example, a patient presents to the practice with a broken tooth. He advises that he was playing a hockey match at school and a teammate accidentally struck him in the face with a hockey stick. So we know that the code for um, an injury comes from the S code. So we already know what our first character is. We know that a fractured tooth code is SO2.5. However, we need to now determine is the fracture an open fracture, which is SO2.51, or is it a closed fracture, SO2.50? If we don't know, we'll use the default code, which is SO2.51. We do know that it's, if it's an S code or it's a T code, we need to put an external course code. And so we need to explain what happened. How did this injury come about? So we would use from chapter W, which indicates falls or exposure to inanimate objects. In this case, a hockey stick would be an inanimate object. W21 is striking against or being struck by a sports equipment, which is appropriate. And W21.20 would refer to striking against or being struck by sports equipment at school or any other institution or public administrative area while engaged in sports activity. So you can see that the complete code now would indicate that the patient came in, had an open fracture of the tooth, forward slash W21.20 as your external course code, which then tells you that the patient was struck by sports equipment. This happened at school or a similar area and that he was playing sport while this happened. And then our last example. A five-year-old patient will present at your practice for the first time complaining of toothache. And upon examination and a periapical peri x-ray, you note that there is significant occlusal caries present on the 7-5. You proceed then with a pulpotomy and a resin restoration. So the clinical codes in this situation would be your limited consultation code since you she appeared for the first time and you only attended to the tooth 75. Um, infection control, periapical radiograph, sterilized instruments, local anesthetic, your pulpotomy code, A307, and then your one surface resin code. So one needs to remember that Q4.0 now needs to be the ICT, ICD-10 code because this is a vital pulp. You're doing a pulpotomy, therefore um, pulpitis would be the diagnosis Pulpitis would um, indicate that the pulp is a vital pulp. So therefore, KO 4.0 must be applied to all the procedure codes, not just to the pulpotomy and the resin codes. All the pro pro uh, procedure codes need to have the same ICD-10 code in this situation, except for, as we previously mentioned, periapical radiograph code could have a Z01.6, which is also appropriate. The same would apply if you are doing a pulp cap on an adult, for example. Um, a pulp cap also necessitates a vital pulp and therefore pulpitis would be the correct diagnosis. So now let us look at various coding errors that are commonly made by doctors and staff members. So um, they often use an uppercase or a capital letter O instead of using a number zero, which leads to rejection of the claim. Um, similarly, they can also use the capital letter I instead of the number one. 
Um, people often code with the primary and the secondary codes, and then either are unaware of the external course codes or they accidentally leave out the external course codes, which then results in an incomplete code. So I'm sure many of you have gotten rejections from the scheme saying that the code, the code is incomplete. Um, and this is what that means. Um, strangely enough, also we have many staff members that tend to use the code Z. 20.2 for procedure code 8110, which is the sterilized instruments code. And this is this couldn't actually be more incorrect because Z30.2 does refer to sterilization. However, it is sterilization in respect of admission for interruption of fallopian tubes or vas deferentia, which is actually a gynecological code. So Z30.2, definitely a big no. And lastly, we have a lot of staff members who um, commonly reply on, uh, rely on their billing software to provide the ICD-10 codes. And these softwares are not updated very regularly. And therefore, sometimes the codes that are provided are quite outdated, which may lead to rejections. So let's recap. We need to remember that the primary code is always the first code. And this is then followed by the secondary code and the other codes. The dot is an integral part of the ICD-10 code. But unlike Twitter, it does not count as a character and it must be re retained in all your primary um, and your, your paper and electronic claims. Um, one does not need to provide a description of the diagnosis on the claim. So by this, I mean, you don't need to write on the claim what the actual diagnosis is in words. You just use the ICD-10 code that will suffice and you do this in order to protect the patient's privacy and confidentiality. Um, a three character code such as a K01 or K00 will never contain a dot or a space or a hyphen, but a four and a five character code will, it must contain the dot, but it will never contain a space or a hyphen. Then ICD-10 codes must be included on all claims or accounts or statements, irrespective of whether that claim or account or statement is going to the patient or it's going to the scheme. And it's also irrespective of any payment plan that has been arranged between any party. Only healthcare providers that are, that are actually treating the patient should be the ones that provide the ICD-10 code because they are essentially the person that has reached the diagnosis. And it is actually improper for a staff member or any kind of a patient or any third party to reach that diagnosis and therefore use or dictate what ICD-10 code should be used. All lab slips must include relevant ICD-10 codes on each item line. And dental claims that include lab work with procedure code 8099 must include the relevant ICD-10 code on that line only and there's no need repeat this code on the detail of the lab claim items. So the World Health Organization has made available an ICD-10 interactive self-learning tool accessed at the following link that, that is listed here. The link was also sent out in our um, February edition of the clinical bulletin that was um, published earlier this year. So you can refer back to that clinical bulletin if you want access to this link. And then we also have published a short list of ICD-10 codes and common ICD-10 codes, as well as the categories that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is available on the SADA website. Okay, that's where I'm going to end my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pabu. I always say if there's few questions in the Q&A tab, that is an indication of how good your presentation was and how, how, how attentive your, your participants have, have been during your presentation. So thank you very much for that. We're going to address some of the questions that are in the Q&A tab. And um, we encourage all the viewers just to put in their questions so that we can post them to Dr. Pabu. Um, the first question, uh, Dr. Pabu, is I have a problem with uh, conditions requiring a secondary code. Example, avulsed tooth, fractured teeth. Example, patients that fracture their teeth involved in a fight at school. I think it would be similar to the hockey example that you had given. Can SADA not publish a summary of how to apply secondary codes? 
The MIT is very details, detailed, most of which is irrelevant to dentists. Okay, so I think a lot of it has been covered now in my presentation. However, I'll be happy to actually share the slides of my presentation so people can refer back. And it does give quite a, an easy to follow guideline on how to do it. Um, the presentation will also be available on YouTube. So people can refer back on YouTube if they'd like to, to just get to refresh their memories in terms of that. Um, but also, you know, people, are, our members are welcome to email me if they have certain, you know, coding queries, they can always just pop me an email and explain what the diagnosis was, and I can try and assist wherever possible. Okay. The second question, what codes are to be used for the following? Minor occlusal equilibrium, uh, dry socket, bite plate, direct pulp cap, and bleaching. Okay, so I don't know these codes off by heart. I'm going to have to also look at my documents. And that's, that's also possibly the advice that you would give members as well to always refer back to the document because, I mean, there's just no way that anybody can memorize all these codes in between the procedure codes as well. So I think that would also be the best advice. Absolutely. So like I say, we have published a short list of codes available on our website. But um, going back to bleaching of a non-vital tooth would be covered by KO 3.7, which would refer to post-eruptive um, color changes of dental heart tissues. Um, like I mentioned in the example, a direct pulp says that you know, the, 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 the pulp is a vital pulp in that case, and therefore you have to use the pulpitis code, and therefore you know, your, your K04.0 would apply. Okay, thanks Doc. And then uh, the other question, or it's got a compliment as well, so that's, that's a plus. <laughs> Thanks for the wonderful lecture. Quick question. With regards to an assistant or another dentist in theater, mm -hmm. what billing codes would be used in the, in the instance, in this instance, if you are being assisted by another dentist to remove wisdom teeth in theater? So remember, you need to provide diagnosis code. That is the most important. That this is you need to explain why the dentist was in theater what was he doing in theater so you know um the patient says or, or, or rather the the member here says billing codes so billing codes i'm not sure if he's referring to procedure codes or icd-10 codes because that's a bit confusing but you know if you if you are referring to the icd-10 codes um you know and removing impacted wisdom teeth then you would use the code for impacted wisdom teeth which is um k01.1 Okay, thank you, Doc. And I think we have a lot of questions that uh, members are asking specific codes. So here's another one, uh, Dr. Pabu. Code that one would use, a, in, sorry, if a tooth is fractured while eating. Okay, so I also, uh, like, like I went through this example on the slides, this is quite a common one that pops up. So your fracture codes, tooth fracture codes would be your S codes. This would be, you know, injury codes example. Um, and the, the tooth fracture codes for, a, for um, in terms of the S code would be SO2.5. You need to then indicate whether it is a, an open fracture or closed fracture. Remember, the open fracture is one in which you have pulpal exposure and the closed fracture in, is one that just involves enamel or dentine. So you don't have pulpal exposure in that case. Um, you know, so it would be SO2.51 or SO2.50. Um, and then you know, you would need more, more information in terms of the circumstances in which that happens to do the external course code. So the external course code, you would need to know, you know, where was the patient when this happened? Um, you know, like she says, the patient was eating, um, you know, so there's different, there's different things that come into play. You need, to, you need a thorough history from the patient to find out exactly how this happened so that you can apply the specific external course code to it. I think this next question is, is very specific because the one, the previous one was speaking about eating in general. 
This one speaks on uh, eating seeds or popcorn. So I think that's where you were, you were referring to as you probe further with, uh, with the patient. Yes, okay. absolutely. So, okay, so now you know what the patient was eating, but you don't know other circumstances. Like you don't know, you know, where the patient was when this happened, example. So, so, so I think we need a little bit more. I would always question the patient, try and get as much information as possible, because remember the code will reject um, if you don't apply the maximum specificity. This, you know, that's what the code actually calls for. Okay. And in, 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 a, in a case of a rejection, uh, Dr. Papu, can a member go back and rectify or do uh, funders normally just uh, outright reject it and never give you a second chance? No, not at all. So what happens is that the, the, the funder, your medical scheme or your third party funder will come back to you and say incomplete code or incorrect code. And they tell you to please amend the coding and then resubmit the claim back to them. And then they'll process the claim as soon as that, that has happened. And this is often what happens is that we get members who then come to us, ask us, look, what is the correct ICD-10 code in this case? We're not always able to assist because remember, we are not the ones that are seeing the patient. We don't have that diagnosis. Um, but if the, if the member can explain to us, look, this was the situation, this is the diagnosis that I reached, then more often than not, I am able to assist them. Okay. And are you able to give the ICD-10 code for dental repairs? I am, if you give me a second. So this would um, be a Z code as well. Um, you know, this would relate to this. There's a chapter under the Z codes which um, relate to fitting and adjusting of dental prosthetic devices. So this would fall under Z 46.3. Okay. And then here's an interesting question as well. Why is, K, why is code K10.3 rejected for treatment of a septic socket? Um, it should not be actually. Why is uh, who? I, I would love mm. that person to send me an email because that actually should not um, be a rejection. If I remember correctly, the code for a dry socket um, is K10.3, which re refers to alveolitis of the doors. And therefore, it shouldn't be rejected and it doesn't require an external course code. So please email me, whoever that person is. Okay. Dr. Alfred Easton, please send an email to Dr. Pabu and uh, she will assist you further with this particular query because she has indicated that this should not be a rejection. And then here's more uh, questions of uh, uh, members asking, caries followed by palpotomy, which code would you use? Okay, so the diagnosis here is a palpitis and therefore you would need to use the palpitis code um, is it's K04.0. So that, you know, like I said, that indicates palpotomy, indicates a vital, vital pulp, you had a palpitis and therefore you need to use that code, not K, not K02.1. Yeah. Oh, okay. the, diagnosis is not the, theory. the diagnosis is the palpitis. Yeah, no, I'm glad you clarified that because the same member had indicated that it should be both of them. So I'm glad you clarified that it's not the K02.1, but instead it's the K04.0. Yes. And then the code, the code to use when filling uh, has, has debonded and fell off. Um, okay. So I'll have a look if you give me a second. It's very difficult to remember these codes offhand. Mm. 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 <laughs> okay, so for that one, there isn't a specific code that is applicable on the list. So I would use the one, um, you know, that relates one of the unspecified codes. So I would use, a02.9 
in that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Pabu. I think we've come to the end of the questions that have come through. I'm going to encourage members and, and participants in this session that if there are any questions that pop up a bit later, because I think these would be uh, uh, continuous questions that you would get in your office, Dr. Pabu, because they're very specific. I mean, I see members actually giving the particular treatment that they, they require a, 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 a code for. So I would encourage members just to send uh, Dr. Pabu an email and she will reply to you as soon as she receives that email. Dr. Pabu, I'm gonna ask you just to uh, give the members your email address so that they can send an email directly to you. Okay, so everyone is welcome to contact me at clinical at sada.co.za. Any type of queries that you have, if you are struggling with schemes, if you are battling with ICD-10 codes where you are pretty sure that the ICD-10 code is actually correct and it shouldn't be rejected, like the case where we had um, of the alveolitis um, code that was rejected. Um, similarly, today I had actually received an email from a member who um, said that Schemes was rejecting the KO 3.6 code. Um, and in that case, you know, I would, I would encourage members to actually send me that rejection. Show me exactly what the scheme has rejected and what the, what the reasoning behind the rejection is. And um, based on that, I will address it with the scheme directly because KO 3.6 in, in this case for a scale and polish is actually 100% correct. So, you know, I would address it with the scheme directly. More often than not, it's actually an error somewhere that they've made. So, yeah, I'm happy to assist members with, with that. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Pablo, Dr. Alfred, uh, Alfred Easton has sent a follow up question. So, yeah. I think it's important that we respond to it. Is it correct to use code K07.4 for minor occlusal equilibrium? Mm, I think. Um, I think he can get away with using KZ as 0.7.4, um, or he could actually get away also with using K07.3 in this case, yes. Okay. And what would be the, the reason for using uh, the two or either okay, one? So Okay, so your K07 um, actually actually relates to dentofacial anomalies, including malocclusion. So, you know, in this case, if you're doing occlusal equi equilibrium, I can't speak properly, <laughs> equilibrium, then, you know, we, we, we assume that there is some malocclusion that is occurring there where, you know, um, he has identified a high spot somewhere and he's just trying to adjust the occlusion um, accordingly. And therefore we think that because that code is an un, K07.4 is an unspecified malocclusion code, it would work. Okay, and then we've got another one. Uh, a case of uh, pericoronitis, which resection, my apologies, which resection done as ginger as gingival gingival infl gingiva is inflamed, uh, and patient is biting on the gum, causing further pain. That's the end of it. I don't know if you can uh, yeah. figure what that or Dr. Taif, if you can just maybe clarify your question there. I'm not getting a question uh, that I can pose to Dr. Pabu. If you can it's just so clarify happy. your question there, then Dr. Pabu. Will Okay, sure. Okay, so look, I think the, the, the perichoronitis uh, relates to the diagnosis and the wedge resection um, was the procedure that she did to remedy that. So the wedge resection would be her clinical code that she uses and um, the perichoronitis would be her ICD-10 code or her diagnostic code, which would indicate why she did the procedure that she did. Um, you know, and therefore, um, you know, she would be able to use um, A04.4 in this case, which I think is other periodontal diseases. It would be the most appropriate code to use. Okay. I think, uh, Dr. Pabu, we've reached the end of our question session. I've checked in the chat section as well. Um, there is nothing. So 
I'm just going to give you two minutes just to give your parting shots before we end the session. Okay, so guys, I, I just like to emphasize that we here at Tata Head Office, we're here to help you. So please don't hesitate with any coding queries or any queries that you have, no matter how insignificant or silly that it may seem. If you have any clinical codes or ICD-10 code queries, please let me know. Um, you know, send me an email, give me a call. I'm, I'm really here to assist you and to guide you wherever I can. And, you know, there's oftentimes schemes when you, when, when our members call schemes and, you know, they reject a certain code, the scheme is not allowed to give them the actual correct code to use because then they prescribing treatment as such. So what they can do then in that situation is, you know, just email us with all the details and then we can assist as, as, as far as possible. And if, if I'm not sure what is meant, why the rejection occurred, then I'll always go directly to the scheme, you know, and try and, and ascertain exactly what the problem was and why the rejection occurred. So I just want to urge members, I think, um, I think prior to me working at SADA, I, I don't think I even called head office once to get coding advice. It's, it's something that never even crossed my mind. And now when I'm at SADA and I get um, almost 10, 20 queries on a daily basis, then I realize actually the value of having someone on the other end of the line where you, know, you can actually just bounce off your ideas and say, look, these are the, the, this is the procedure I'm doing. Are the codes correct? Should I be charging anything more? Because I also realize that a lot of us rob ourselves a lot of the time. You know, we, we don't even know of certain codes that exist that we should be applying in certain situations. Um, you know, so, so that's why I say I urge you, please reach out to me and I will be more than happy to assist with any queries or, or any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Pabu. And I think this was a very uh, uh, fruitful discussion that you, you had with the members. And I think they, you reassured them that they will really benefit from contacting you. So thank you for availing yourself and thank you very much for, for this session. And we're gonna call it a night. And I just wanna remind uh, members who have attended the session, please, uh, can you just do the, 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 the poll that will come out at the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.